começar a... Coloca a Fernanda. Uhum. Bom dia, pessoal. Bem-vindos. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Bem-vindos. É, a gente, antes de fazer a abertura, estou só esperando que as pessoas entrem para dar algumas explicações sobre o uso do Zoom e principalmente da interpretação. I'm waiting for some people to get in so we can give some explanation on how to deal with the interpretation here on Zoom. Ok. Então, bom dia mais uma vez. É um prazer ter vocês aqui com a gente para esse encontro. É, nós temos aqui conosco a possibilidade de interpretação. So, good morning, everyone. We have here today the possibility of, for interpretation. If you need English translation, go to the to the the bottom below your screen. There you you find interpretation. In the, you click that button, and you are going to see English and Portuguese. When we are speaking English. You, and you need Portuguese, click on Portuguese. If we are speaking Portuguese and you need English, you click on English. Então, gente, na parte de baixo do Zoom, tem ali vários botões. Um deles é interpre interpretation ou interpretação. Se a gente estiver falando aqui em, em, em inglês, vocês quiserem ouvir em português, vocês clicam lá em português. Se a gente estiver falando aqui em, em português, vocês quiserem ouvir em inglês, vocês clicam lá em inglês, tem intérprete. Todo mundo entendeu essa, essa explicação? Tudo bem? É que eu ainda não expliquei para as pessoas irem para a sala, por isso que eu estou dando a explicação nas duas línguas, viu, Sérgio? Como as pessoas ainda não foram para a sala, então eu estou explicando nas duas línguas. Então... Those who need interpretation for Portuguese, please move to Portuguese in interpretation. Aqueles que precisarem de intérprete para o inglês, vai lá para o inglês na interpretação, tá, gente? Então, é isso. A outra coisa, nós daqui a pouco vamos começar a apresentação do Peter. A gente vai colocar... O, o, o Spotlight na intérprete de Libras, que está aqui. Então, vocês não verão o Peter. Se quiserem ver o Peter e outras pessoas, vocês têm que ir manualmente no View, lá em cima, e escolher Gallery ou Galeria. Senão, vocês vão ver a intérprete, ouvir o, o Peter e ver a, a apresentação. tá certo? Parte caso, Bom, então é isso, gente. Muito obrigada e eu vou passar a palavra para isso para a gente começar os trabalhos. Bem-vindos mais uma vez e não esqueçam, se alguém chegou depois, temos a interpretação na parte de baixo do Zoom, onde está escrito interpretação ou interpretation. <coughs> Só mais uma coisa, a gente pede que todo mundo fique com os, os microfones desligados, que é para a gente evitar qualquer tipo de interferência, tá? Por favor. Posso começar, né? Good morning to all uh, is, uh, who participate in this international seminar. I'm Cecilia Magalhães from the Applied Linguistics and Language Studies, postgraduation program of Pontificial Catholic University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's an immense pleasure to be with Professor Peter Jones from Sheffield Hallam University from UK, and with all of you to discuss the most important theoretical and methodological issues of Marx and Vygotsky in the six meetings that start uh, today. This seminar was conceived and organized by Peter Jones and a group of professors from three Brazilian universities and different research groups. Cília Magalhães, Fernanda Liberali, Wanda Junqueira Ia, and Angela Alessa and Viviane Carrijo from the Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo. Sueli Fidalgo from the Federal University of Sao Paulo, um, and uh, Adolf Tanzinet from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and hopefully, um, uh, Sueli uh, and Ia couldn't uh, stay with us today. 
it's organized, it's just organized as a monthly meeting on Thursdays starting today and that's May 12th, on June 9th, August 11th, September 15th, October 13th, and November 10th, uh, from 11 a.m. to 13 p.m. Actually, that's Brasilia time. Actually, the discussion we start today are a deepening of previous discussion we've been developing with Peter Jones since 20. 17. Peter is currently reader in language and communication department of humanities at Sheffield Harlan University. He conducts research at the Humanities Research Center and has um, published extens extensively in lead journals uh, alone or with colleagues on inter integrationist, integrationist linguistics Marx and Vygotsky theoretical and methodological basis, the role of language in social transformation uh, in Paulo Freire and Lev Vygotsky, Ilienkov and the methodological problems in contemporary activity theory and the Marxian legacy. Peter has published chapters and organized books on Marxism and education, pedagogy and culture, cultural, historical and critical psychology. He also participates uh, in special issues as editor of the journal Elsevier to discuss Karl Marx and the language science critical encounters. Mm -hmm. Now, let's listen to Peter's introduction um, of this uh, session. Peter, is to you now. Bom dia. Olá a todos. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Great to be with you thank thank you so much for inviting me and it's uh, it's lovely to to be able to talk to you all today it's uh, it's exciting and a humbling experience for me and thank you for that introduction as well i'll begin directly by uh, sharing my screen if uh, humanly possible I hope that's okay. Thank you. Yes, as CISA has said, we've organized this series of seminars in order to look once more at, at very important issues for us, specifically in the relationship between Vygotsky and Marx. In particular, the extent to which we might see Vygotsky's perspectives on psychology as consistent with or as a creative development of Marx's own work and Marx's legacy. And in particular, the role of Marx's dialectical method of investigation and exposition as so clearly set out in his Capital. As we know, Vygotsky himself attempted to contribute to such a methodological advance uh, in terms of developing a general science of psychology and referred specifically to Marx's capital for that, as we will see. And so it's an important question for us to ask whether and to what extent Vygotsky achieved this aim in his work, and indeed whether such a goal was realistic or realizable in psychology at all. And so in order to answer those questions or approach them, and, and, and I'm certainly not going to give you any answers in this series, um, we need to focus, I think, on a, on a, on a range of issues. Um, what was Marx himself trying to do? What did he achieve? Why did he approach his work in that way? And what can we learn from that, both positively and negatively? And similarly, what did Vygotsky set out to achieve? What did he think he was doing? 
um, how did he see his own relationship to Marx and the relationship between his work and Marx's work and the Marxist tradition more generally? And what do we now, from our vantage point, make of all of that? Are we in a better position now, after nearly 90 years, after Vygotsky's death, to see some of these things more clearly? So that's the background, I think, um, in terms of the general idea of the seminar series to look at the relationship between Marx and Vygotsky. There are a number of readings associated with this. I've, I've given uh, links, I think CESA has provided links to those, some of those texts. But I owe you an apology today um, because in working through these issues, I realized that I needed to refer to other texts as well. Uh, these texts, I'm sure, will be available in Portuguese as well through the Marxists.org site. Um, but uh, I'm going to refer in particular to Marx's capital uh, directly. Um, there's also, within this issue, there is the question of Hegel. <laughs> Marx's relationship to Hegel, and as well as Vygotsky's relationship to Hegel. Um, in fact, it was a question that, uh, that Fernanda raised right from the beginning as to whether we could have readings uh, from Hegel as well as from uh, some of the Marxists and uh, Vygotsky. Uh, but I refer you here to the, the paper by Andy Blunden, who I think shows quite clearly that references to Hegel's work directly by Vygotsky are uh, very rare um, and not, not clear in terms of direct reference. Although there is perhaps one passage in particular which we might be interested in, which I'll talk about later perhaps. So in, in relation to the questions that we've got, I, I just I wanted to quote uh, from a, a paper of my own on, on this, which I think at least gave my, my view on this a couple of years ago. And uh, I have to say that my views change every time I, I read anything. <laughs> so that's probably not a good recommendation. Uh, but in looking at the relationship between Marx and Vygotsky a few years ago, uh, my, my own thoughts in general, just to set the scene, were, were the following. Uh, that Vygotsky distinguished himself by what I call the relative circumspection which he displayed in approaching the task of creating a Marxist psychology and in reflecting on his own claims to fame in that department. He acknowledged the dangers of bending the process of open-minded intellectual exploration to fit passages from the classic Marxist texts plucked out of context. Vygotsky believed that significant theoretical advances would only come through creative assimilation of the distinctive analytical method of Marx and Marx's capital. A Marxist psychology was therefore a dream of the future rather than an existing paradigm at that time. At the same time, neither in Marx nor in Vygotsky do we find a finished body of work, but passing products of thinkers who were engaged in restless revision of their own assumptions and conclusions. Moreover, and perhaps most importantly, Vygotsky was breaking new ground. In constructing his unique, always evolving perspective on human psychological capacities, Vygotsky was weaving together a novel system of semiological constructs. 
that had no parallel in Marx and Engels. And it is in this creative legacy that the formidable challenge of evaluating Vygotsky's relation to Marx ultimately lies. In other words, whatever the discussion in Marx or Vygotsky of, of method in the abstract, at the end of the day, it's looking at what Vygotsky contributed concretely in his novel theoretical advances that is the main problem for us, I think. And if such considerations, amongst others, make assessment of the vygotsky mark relation very difficult, to say the least, that doesn't mean that it's a pointless exercise, given the issues at stake, which I know are important for us all. And the way forward, this is what I said at the time, is in taking bearings from our current standpoint of knowledge and experience on the overall arc of Vygotsky's contribution, its fundamental assumptions, positions, orientation, practical application and potential in relation to the arc of Marx's own work, itself viewed critically in the light of 21st century knowledge and events. This is a task demanding considerable collaborative effort and debate. And while consensus will not be reached, we'll never agree on everything, the process of clarification of the fault lines of intellectual and political difference will be revealing and productive in itself. And I suggested that to approach Vygotsky in this way, therefore, is actually to approach the Russian Revolution itself from a particular angle, to feel its daring and iconoclasm, its blinding insights, its colossal achievements, its promise, and at the same time, its haste, its contradictions, its difficulties, mistakes, and failures. Mm -hmm. And we should be able to learn from both. And so my friends, I think that what we are doing uh, today and in the seminars to follow, I, I think is part of that process and will hopefully allow us to participate together in a collaborative spirit in this kind of process of clarification. In terms of the revolution itself, of course, um, Vygotsky was um, an important, powerful contributor to revo the revolutionary developments throughout society after 1917. But the revolution was also many things. Um, it was an, one of the most important social upheavals in human history with enormous potential a socialist revolution for the first time. But the revolution also degenerated. And that process of degeneration itself needs to be understood, but also we need to take account of that as well, I think, when we are looking at how Vygotsky worked and his colleagues worked and the contributions that they were able to make in that very in the changing context um, that, that they were living in um, and the changing political goals, institutions, political and theoretical atmosphere and so on in which they were working. So, <laughs> in other words, this is not an easy one. <laughs> this is hard. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's torturing me again after <laughs> many years of looking at these problems. But uh, what then in that context did I think, we, did we all think the most important things were? And we've, we were able, I think, to isolate and identify a number of topics to look at throughout this series. First of all, Marx's dialectical method 
in general. And I, I put dialectical method in quotes because there is controversy, as you will know, about the very existence of such a thing. Uh, but nevertheless, let's let's proceed for the moment. So Marx's method in general, and as represented in his major contributions in relation to the materialist conception of history, and more specifically, the method of capital, Marx's capital. To what extent can this method be applied to anywhere else? <laughs> and to what kinds of object, what kinds of phenomena? How might this method and the work on capital in particular, how might it be relevant to the problems of psychology as a general issue? Secondly, how best can we understand the problem of ethnocentrism and ethnocentric evolutionism in Marx's historicism and its significance in relation to decolonizing movements and decolonizing science? How do these problems manifest themselves in Vygotsky's work, if they do? And in particular, how might we see evidence of that in his approach to the historical development of cultural forms and the process of child development? Thirdly, how does Vygotsky initially envision the development of a dialectic of psychology or a psychological materialism? inspired and informed by his study of Marx, Brackets and Hegel, let's assume. What is the starting point for Vygotsky in terms of developing a conception of human development? What's the direction of travel for this development? Towards what state? Towards what? Fourthly, what concrete steps did Vygotsky take in beginning to elaborate his psychological materialism? And how did his ideas change and develop? So we can look at the key moments in this intellectual journey in relation to Marx's and Hegel's dialectic method, and in particular, the so-called germ cell methodology. And here then we see in, in Vygotsky, if we take his, his work in time, in terms of a, an evolution of his own thinking, we see that both the, assum the, the assumptions, the, the facts, the methodology, and so on, all change in the course of 10 years before his, up to his death in 1934. And his, de his death did not mark a finished point in his intellectual evolution by any stretch of the imagination. So we've got a moving target in Vygotsky. We've got a moving object, a dynamic work in progress. Um, what we can do therefore is to look at key points in that evolution in terms of the, the question that we're interested in, namely to what extent was Vygotsky able to assimilate this Marxian method as part of his psychological research and in the specific theoretical concepts and terminology which he developed, uh, which of course had no, had no parallel or ground in Marx's own work. Um, and I've, I've listed some of the main issues there and we may decide that we think some of those are more central or more important uh, than than others for the purposes of the topic under discussion so in other words it's we want to look closely at vygotsky's statements and discussions of methodological issues but also and perhaps more importantly at the way he developed his methodological principles in the elaboration of this novel system and dynamically changing system of theoretical constructs. Friends, I, 
that that's the kind of general idea i think of the of the uh, of the seminar series um so i thought i would if that's okay i would move on move on to have a look at the what we can look at in the first session and so i thought in this first session we would we would have a look at um the starting points for some of those main problems. First of all, Marx's dialectical method. Secondly, the issue of direction, a development and direction of development in Marx's historicism, in, in Marx's historical view of the development of social formations. What assumptions in, are in play? How is the fact of development itself, the, the, the and the concept of development, how is that established in Marx? Does Marx have a model? Does he have a view, an assumption of universal human social development or direction? And that's important, I think, for a number of reasons. So this evolutionary historicism is an important issue, I think, which again is controversial. And thirdly, Vygotsky's discussion in his incredible early text, The Historical Meaning of the Crisis in Psychology, which, conclude, which includes a number of key methodological discussions, as well as a very interesting critique of the psychological landscape of the day and uh, not least his uh, forthright criticisms of attempts being made at that time to develop a Marxist psychology. Um, again, what assumptions are in play with Vygotsky and how does he begin at that point to elaborate the beginnings of an approach to, or, or, to an approach to a general psychology. Okay, how are we doing for time? All right. So uh, for this first session then, when we come to look at Marx's uh, method, I wanted to have a look at those texts in, in Marx and Engels but in other authors as well, which focus on questions of Marx's general approach, uh, his standpoint and his method of analysis uh, in particular. And then go on to see how, what Vygotsky makes of this. Um, so we'll have a look at some key passages um, and readings. Um, First of all, the context of Marx's statements on method and methodology, in particular in relation to the materialist conception of history as set out in the German ideology. Um, this question that I've, ra I've raised of a historical developmental approach and whether that has a teleological ingredient. Then Marx's capital, specifically, the dialectical method and germ cell methodology, which Marx himself discusses. So I thought we'd start with, with those problems or issues. In terms of the first issue, the context. Before we can understand capital, Marx's capital, we, it's important to place that in the context of the work that Marx and Engels had been doing since together since the 1940s, 1840s, 1840s. And in particular in their, in the book that they wrote together in 1846, um, the German ideology as it's referred to, um, which was unpublished. Um, and it's an interesting and I think important fact that this book, which we, value so highly today for its 
discussion of, of, of the basic approach that Marx and Engels had. This book was not published until 1932 and therefore was unknown to Vygotsky and, in, and therefore inaccessible. Uh, did Vygotsky become acquainted with the book when it was published in 1932? I'm not sure. Um, perhaps someone knows, but we could certainly look into that. Would it have made a difference to Vygotsky's work had he been familiar with the German ideology? I think it would, but that's pure speculation. Um, we should also note that Marx's earlier writings, his so-called early writings, particularly the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1833, where he discusses alienation, the state, democracy, and human nature, amongst other things, these writings weren't known either. These weren't published till much later. Would that have made a difference? Again, I think it would, but that again is pure speculation. But it's in these writings, in the early writings, uh, in particular that Marx develops his emphasis on humanness and the regaining and claiming of humanness that is trapped within alienated social formations. And although that may appear to be a, a preoccupation of his in his Hegelian days and before he was a, a proper Marxist, I don't think that's true. These are the issues which, he, which um, with which he was occupied all of his life. And this in fact is what it's all about. It's about humanness. It's about how we regain a life that is worthy of our human potential, our human nature. So those early considerations um, expressed in, in, in beautiful, often lyrical ways. These are the themes that stayed with Marx all his life. And I think the, um, the early writings are therefore important for that. But in the German ideology, of course, we, we have plenty of statements on methodology at, at that time. Uh, I've quoted one here. The premises from which we begin are not arbitrary ones, not dogmas, but real premises from which abstraction can only be made in the imagination. They're the real individuals, their activity, and the material conditions under which they live, both those which they find already existing and those produced by their activity. These premises can thus be verified in a purely empirical way. It's just one of the one of the most one of the many striking statements in the German ideology about methodology. But how do you do that? How do you carry that kind of methodological vision out in terms of specific a specific social formation? How would you do it, for example, for capitalist production? So the elaboration of a method of doing that, the method which Marx developed for capital, clearly that was what occupied Marx for many decades, which involved an enormous amount of empirical research and constantly working out what to do with all this empirical material, how to find relevant material, and how in particular to see the interconnections between all these facts, which Marx was looking at from a particular standpoint, of course. And it's in this sense that Marx, Marx's method 
developed, informed by his own understanding of Hegel, but in no way was this some kind of imposition of a, an abstract framework onto a mass of empirical facts. This was a working, a, a way of working out how these facts are themselves interconnected, the contradictory movement of those facts. But nevertheless, this is all from the standpoint that Marx took, and that standpoint was humanness. And in particular, as he expressed it in his theses on Feuerbach, the standpoint of socialized humanity. It wasn't a disinterested scientific or intellectual piece of work. It was about how do we get rid of this system? What do we have to do? Any understanding of it was guided by that. What do we have to do to get rid of this crazy system in which our humanness is expressed only in distorted, in poor, horrible, terrible ways. And I'll come back to that in a bit. Let me also take the, the issue of Marx's historical approach. Are you okay? No, I could just hear something. Um, if you have a developmental approach, a historical approach to the development of, of something, how do you know what the starting point is and the direction of travel? Now, in some cases, of course, we have what we call a teleological view. We see what's happening now as, as if it was aiming towards or directed towards some future state. So in other words, we impose a view of what's going to happen in, in the future on our understanding and analysis of what is happening in the present. And this is an issue, of course, uh, in all historical treatments and also an issue in Marx. Um, is there a sense in which Marx had a view of some kind of universal direction of human development? Lower stages, higher stages, and the highest stage of communism and so on and so forth. Now, um, this is an important one, as we'll see, an important issue, I think. Um, it's very nicely examined in Theodore Shannon's uh, book by Derek Sayer and Philip Corrigan. And they say that at times, Marx certainly adopted an evolutionist idiom in the pre presentation of his general conclusions, as in what he called himself the progressive epochs in the economic formation of society of the 1859 In other words, this idea of a progressive development of humanity or a progressive development of human society seems to be obviously implied by that. And uh, these authors say that Marx had obvious enough reasons for claiming scientific status for this, for the, th the theories of progress and for drawing attention to their affinities with theories in natural science, which also upheld the mutability of the world and the role of struggle in advancement. But whether capital and other works by the mature Marx rest on an essential kernel of evolutionism in any stronger sense than this is a more difficult question, they say. Certainly, Marx praised Darwin in particular um, for what the authors call, what, what he celebrated in Darwin's book was precisely that it deals the death blow to teleology in the natural sciences. The very idea that the present is heading towards a particular goal in the future. And they say that this forms part of a long-standing hostility on Marx's part to teleological explanations in history. 
which dates back at least to the text which first proclaimed the fundamentals of historical materialism, the German ideology of 1845 to six. In that book, any idea that later history is the goal of earlier history is ridiculed as a speculative distortion. What is designated by the words destiny, goal, germ, or idea of earlier history is nothing but an abstraction from later history, says Marx. And, and Marx means that in a bad way, in terms of an abstraction. What follows from that then for our methodological issues, the germ cell methodology, and so on? That's a question we'll come back to. So, the crucial question is then whether Marx did see the whole of human history in terms of a single line or various lines or narratives of development of the whole of humanity from the same starting point or origin. This is an issue obviously for those of, us, those of you concerned with the decolonizing aspects, this universal narrative of human development and different societies or communities on different levels of development, so to speak. And it's more, more important now, obviously, in, uh, than, uh, and more is known than in Marx's day. We know more about the historical time depth of human communities and indeed different varieties and kinds of human being. It becomes impossible to see this as one single developmental history driven by any particular force. And certainly impossible to look abstractly at human history and see when we see communities who have very ancient histories, possibly continuity, continuities of life, of tens of thousands of years or more in particular places in the world. It's impossible to see this as some kind of primitive society or as our, all, our universal ancestors or some such. There are grounds at times for thinking that Marx did have this evolutionist view or could be reasonably interpreted as saying so. And this is, I think, is on two grounds. First of all, Marx's view of pre-capitalist social formations and the general view he had of the natural history of humanity or the study of history as part of natural history. And secondly, his use, let's say, or reinvention of Hegel's dialectic. And Hegel's dialectic method itself was an all-encompassing universal narrative of development to what extent then in taking on board Hegel and reworking Hegel, are we also imbibing, taking in these assumptions about universal historical development and evolution? And I think those are the things to think about. For example, take, take what Marx says in Capital. He's talking about uh, pre-capitalist social formations. And he says those ancient social organisms of production are much more simple and transparent than those of bourgeois society. But they are founded, he says, either on the immaturity of man as an individual, when he's not yet torn himself loose from the umbil umbilical cord of his natural species connection with other men, or on direct rela relations of dominance and servitude. They're conditioned by a low stage of development of the productive powers of labor and correspondingly limited relations between men within the process of creating and reproducing their material life. Hence also limited relations between man and nature. These real limitations are reflected in the ancient worship of nature and in other elements of tribal religion. So there are problems for us there, I think, in thinking about that. However, 
it must also be said that Marx also in his later work, his later thinking, particularly about Russia and the Russian Revolution, I mean, not the Russian Revolution, but a Russian Revolution, was keen to argue against those who thought that he had produced a unilinear model or a universal model of socio-historical development. As he said himself, um, in relation to uh, the Russian revolutionaries, in a, in a letter, in fact, to them, my critic, he says, absolutely insists on transforming my historical sketch of the genesis of capitalism in Western Europe into a historico-philosophical theory of the general course fatally imposed on all peoples, whatever the historical circumstances in which they find themselves placed in order to arrive at this economic formation, which assures the greatest expansion of the productive forces of social labor. But success, he said, will never come with the master key of a general historico-philosophical theory whose supreme virtue consists in being super-historical. And so I think we can see that Marx, certainly in, in his later thinking, either changed his view or, or perhaps represented his views to be quite clearly against some kind of universal process, singular, linear, unilinear process of human development. And this was the starting point indeed for his, um, or, or rather the end point of his thinking about Russia and the prospects for a revolution in Russia. To what extent do we see any parallel to these notions of universal human, human development or universal unilinear historical development in psychology, in Vygotsky's psychology? That again, I think, is something that we need to have a look at together. If we turn to Marx's capital itself then, as we all know, the, the book was, was famed, celebrated, and also very controversial because of the way that Marx had researched and presented his research on political economy. Um, Marx calls capital a critique of political economy, and, it, and indeed, that's, that's the focus. It, it, he's criticizing the bourgeois economists. He's taking their ideas apart, showing what lies behind them, and therefore also unveiling the workings of a system which their own theoretical constructions had missed or had distorted in particular ways. Um, this is how Marx explains his own working um, in terms of methodology. In the preface to the first edition of Capital, the value form he says, whose fully developed shape is the money form. It's very simple and slight in content. Nevertheless, the human mind has sought in vain for more than 2000 years to get to the bottom of it. While on the other hand, there's been at least an approximation to a successful analysis of forms which are much richer in content and more complex. Why? Because the complete body is easier to study than itself. Moreover, in the analysis of economic forms, neither microscopes nor chemical reagents are of assistance. The power of abstraction must replace both. But for bourgeois society, he says, the commodity form of the product of labor or the value form of the commodity is the economic cell form. 
And this idea of a cell form as the starting point for elaborating the development of a particular social formation is the, the key aspect of this particular contribution. But what is Marx trying to do in Capital with this? Well, in effect, what he's trying to do is to show, first of all, that human activity, human productive activity, and the social relations between people in their productive activity takes on absurd forms, crazy forms. The money, money is a crazy thing. Wages, all of the categories, all of the evident empirical categories of the capitalist mode of production are absurd for Marx. They're crazy. His task, as he sees it, is to, is to find out why and how human creative productive activity is expressed in these crazy forms, these absurd forms. And in particular, how these relations of production are expressed in relations between material objects, not as social relations. And he says the categories of bourgeois economics consist precisely of forms of this kind. That's to say absurd forms, which nevertheless are forms of thought which are socially valid and therefore objective for the relations of production belonging to this historically determined mode of production. And Marx aims to penetrate this absurdity and the heights of absurdity of these forms as they develop outside of our control by identifying the value form in the shape of the commodity, which lies at the foundation of this absurd, crazy system of production in which human relations are distorted and trapped to appear as relations between material objects. And Marx criticizes the bourgeois economic, economists, despite their efforts, for not being able to penetrate and analytically dissolve these forms. Why, for example, he says, is the measurement of labor by its duration expressed in the magnitude of the value of the product? Why is labor expressed in value? And he says these formulas which bear the unmistakable stamp of belonging to a social formation in which the process of production has mastery over man instead of the opposite, appear to the political economist's bourgeois consciousness to be as much a self-evident and nature-imposed necessity as productive labor itself. So Marx's method is one that's aimed at getting inside these forms, asking why, why does human productive activity take these absurd forms? These absurd forms, these absurd formulas of the bourgeois economists in describing these belong therefore to a social formation in which the process of production has mastery over man. And as he says, the whole mystery of commodities, all the magic and necromancy that surrounds the products of labor on the basis of commodity production vanishes, therefore, as soon as we come to other forms of production. All these categories of wages, value, price, profit, surplus value, all this sort of stuff, profits, it goes if you look at other forms of organization of society. All this weird stuff is just not there. In Capital, he takes a fictional example 
to illustrate. He says, take Robinson Crusoe on his island. He still needs to he still has needs to satisfy and must therefore perform useful labors of various kinds. Despite the diversity of his productive functions, he knows that they're only different forms of activity of one and the same Robinson. Hence, only different modes of human labor, of his labor. Necessity itself compels him to divide his time with precision between his different functions. Of course, he's got to do fishing, catch some fish, he's got to build a fire, etc. All the relations between Robinson and these objects that form his self-created wealth are here so simple and transparent that even Mr. Sedley Taylor, that's a, a, a leading economist of Marx's day, even Sedley Taylor could understand this. So here then, any value form is identical with the usefulness of the products of labor to be consumed and enjoyed. The labor time required for the production of these objects is exactly equal to the time it takes Robinson to make them. And the situation, the same situation, Marx says, is true of an association of free people working, this is, he's projecting into the future, working with the means of production held in common and expending their many different forms of labor power in full self-awareness as with one single social labor force. In other words, we don't need a theory to understand that. We don't need a germ cell methodology. It's everything simple and transparent. In both of these cases, people themselves have mastery over their own process of production. The social relations of the individual producers, both towards their labor and the products of their labor are here transparent in their simplicity, in production, as well as in distribution, he says. And similarly, when Marx looks at feudal society, European feudal society, medieval times, he emphasizes the same thing. He says here, precisely because relations of personal dependence form the given social foundation, there's no need for labor in its products to assume a fantastic form different from their reality. Here, he says, the social relations between individuals in the performance of their labor appear at all events as their own personal relations and are not disguised as social relations between things, between the products of labor. And this is a very important point then. The the Marx's discovery that in capitalist production, social relations, social relations take the forms of things. And that's why the system is out of control. It doesn't apply in that way to other forms of society, other social, other forms, other, other social formations. We don't have that mystification. We don't have that inversion. We don't have that fetishization of material objects. Capitalist production does, and that's for that purpose that this particular methodology has been developed by Marx. You don't need that methodology to understand Robinson Crusoe. It's, it's obvious what he's doing. He, he knows it. He can keep account of it, but he doesn't need a germ cell methodology to understand how labor works on his island, and similarly with the free association of producers. So I think the important thing then, one, well, one thing here is when we're looking at Marx's methodology and how it may or may not be relevant to Vygotsky's work or to psychology, we have to ask, are we doing the same thing here that Marx was doing actually? Are we looking at the same kind of problem? Marx's germ cell methodology is not a methodology for understanding human activity or human labor in general, no. It's for the particular crazy and absurd forms that human activity takes under capitalist production. That's why he developed this specific 
methodology of, of analysis. But you may say, well, okay, but how does Marx get out of the problem he's identified himself? Namely, that of the absurd forms that capitalist production takes. How does he escape from that? The commodity certainly is one of these forms of capitalist production. But it's precisely because he answers these questions. He asks these questions. Why does labor take that form? Why do the products of labor, why does labor time look like this? And in his analysis, he shows how, just exactly how this comes to be. This is not a universal, timeless phenomenon. This is a, a transient state in which our productive powers have been seized, have been alienated from us. And it's our job to understand how that alienation happens every single day. And where is the way out? How, is the, how do we get out of it? We've got the potential for that. This is what Marx calls the standpoint of socialized humanity. We can do it. We, we, we're not subject fatalistically to the laws of capitalist production or anything like this. No, this, this is all crazy. We've got, and now we now have, we've got the means, we've got the potential, the capacity to end these laws. There's no historical necessity about it. This is our job. And the key category then, again, turns out to be humanness. As Cyril Smith says in his reimagining of, of Marx or revisiting of Marx, the key category of Marx's theoretical work was the one he says which Marxism, and he's very uh, insulting about particular types of Marxist interpretation, was the one which Marxism sought to evade, the idea of humanness. And he says, without it, notions like capital, proletariat, surplus, have no meaning. His standpoint, that of human society or socialized humanity, enabled Marx to understand that certain forms of human life were beneath the dignity of human homo sapiens, not worthy and appropriate for their human nature. But how can we then, when we're working theoretically, how can we be sure that we're not simply theorizing or uncritically modeling the absurd forms of an alienated and alienating social system? And Smith puts it this way, he says, for Marx, hidden inside these very absurd forms was a human content which science had to discover. That's his work. Within the framework of individualism, inside which men and women had to fight each other to live, they retained their potential for self-determination, self-creation, self-consciousness and social solidarity. Indeed, it was only because there was a mismatch between this humanity and its inhuman forms and because people had to struggle to fight out this discrepancy, that it was possible to know which way up the world should go. That I think is very important and key to understanding Marx's view of development. It's not imposed on an understanding of the world. It's a, it's a recognition of the fight that we are in to get out of this system. It's, it's we are the ones that are driving that. And it's understanding that struggle to end this absurd system that shows us which way to go. Once we, once we take that as our focus and criterion, then we can follow it and we can make sense of the world that we are trapped in and the world that we can create together. Friends, it is um, nearly quarter past four and I um, haven't even got on to Vygotsky yet. <laughs> so I wonder, I, I could do a very short 
let's say 10 minutes um, on Vygotsky at this stage, or um, given that we do have uh, five more seminars, if you prefer, we could leave the question of what, what Vygotsky made of this um, for the second seminar, but I am open to your suggestion as I've, I've taken so much of your time already. Cecil, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, you're on mute. <laughs> Uh, I don't say, I don't know. I think that, um, I think that your idea is good because, you know, it's very interesting and to understand the relationship between Vygotsky and Marx, you have to understand the, the ideas you were putting here. So you were discussing now, but I don't know. I saw that in the chat, there are several questions. Okay. I don't know. Maybe you can stop and see the questions. Yeah. That's great, yeah. That's lovely, yeah. I'll just, yeah. shall I stop sharing at the moment or? Yeah, Vivi, uh, could you see the questions? Put... Let's take the questions. So who put questions? So the people could ask the questions. Where are the people? I think that. Uh, okay. Bom dia. Bom dia. Good é, morning. Vou organizar minha pergunta aqui, só um minutinho. Bom, é, diante da palestra yes. do professor Peter, né, é, estava refletindo a respeito do nosso contexto atual, que é a realidade do novo ensino médio, né, que foi um, que é um, pro, um projeto de educação que na verdade não foi dialogado, né? Ele foi imposto na educação pública brasileira, né? E essa proposta de novo ensino médio, se nós analisarmos a fundo, é, nós vamos ver que ela mercantiliza a educação, porque ela tem tornado a educação um produto, né? Um produto para agir é, fazendo funcionar o, o modelo econômico capitalista, porque ela forma mão de obra barata. Né, para dar continuidade a essa engrenagem que é o capitalismo. Então, é, desse modo, a economia política, elas, elas estão transformando a educação em uma educação opressora e, consequentemente, em um produto. Então, minha pergunta é, senhor Peter, é, o senhor acredita que possamos transformar a educação em libertadora, sendo que nós vivemos em um modelo econômico capitalista? Thank you very much for that question. Um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there are colleagues here who, who, who will have a thought uh, on that, um, not just from theory, but from their own practical work um, along these lines. Uh, clearly, as you as you say, um, one one of the features of of a of, of, of a capitalist society is that where there is um, profit to be made, then whatever activities are are involved, traditional activities or what have you, they will be taken over and forced into particular modes of operation in order to either generate profit themselves um, through private education, private schools, whatever, or they will be co-opted and included and integrated into particular systems of governance, of control, uh, of discipline, and so on, of, uh, of, of working class communities and families. Um, in order both to ideologically um, subjugate as well as to um, define the particular possible outcomes and avenues for any kind of productive learning so that 
the, the whole notions of learning themselves, of teaching and learning, of abilities, of potential, it all becomes corrupted in, in this way, which is what happens to all human faculties and capacities generally under capitalist production. There's a tendency for all of that to be turned into its opposite. So learning as a universal human capacity and potential becomes doing what they tell you at school uh, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, how, precisely how we are to change that and to trans transform that um, it, it is a big question. And, and of course, uh, your contributions of, of Brazilian colleagues and theorists, not least, of course, Paulo Freire and so on, are centered on this problem of how, how to reclaim uh, the human capacities and creative potential of, of learning from these alienated and estranged forms of, uh, of, of being and activity. Um, clearly, for, for any human capacity, we, we, we have to be able to think of ways in which we can free that capacity from the direct um, control of the state in particular. How can we make these things, under, how can we bring these things or begin to bring these things under the control of communities? How can, how can community, communities self-organize education or have an influence at least on the goals, on the organization, on the curricula, uh, on the methods of education, including teachers in that. So this, this is not just something that can happen in, in education itself, but has, has to be a, a society-wide, I think, um, uh, project to, re, to, to attempt to reclaim uh, ed education from these kinds of exploitative um, frameworks and so on. So I'm sure there are other colleagues who've got a better thought on that than me, but but I thank you for the question. And, and along those general lines, I think that would be my answer for that. Uh, we have four students, four hands up. Uh, José Luiz Ortega, uh, Luiz Gonçalves, Josélia Santos e Tânia Ramalho. Eu gostaria de que você só então colocasse as suas questões. Tá, então posso fazer, Cecília? Está me ouvindo, Cecília? Está me ouvindo? Muito baixo. É Para mim está muito baixo. Esse está melhor agora? Posso falar? Ah, melhor, melhor. É, eu vou fazer em inglês, tudo bem, Cecília? Você acha que eu faço melhor? Em é melhor fazer em inglês, é assim. Ele já escuta e o pessoal tradu... entra na tradução. Ah, então tá bom. É, thank you, é, Professor Peter Jones. I would like to ask two questions. Um, first, uh, even without uh, reading the German ideology and the, the manuscripts, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, did Vygotsky manage to develop central ideas contained in, in these books? And the other question, uh, I would like to know uh, if Vygotsky was persecuted by the Stalinist regime. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, yes, Vygotsky made uh, a very systematic attempt to contribute to a general psychology or psychological materialism, as he called it at that point, made, made a number of important contributions in an attempt to, I would say, um, do do a kind of a psychological version of, of capital. In other words, the method of capital. Um, but there are different ways in which he came to conclusions about that at different points in his career. So if we look at 1925 and the crisis uh, text, He's talking about the germ cell methodology. But what is the germ cell <laughs> that he focuses on in that text? He, he talks about understanding a single reaction. In other words, he, at that point, he's still within the general framework of 
ideas of reflexology, Pavlovian reflexology, and Kornilov's reactology. And then he moves on. So what we've got to see, I think, is that this is a, this is a, a series of attempts by Vygotsky to do justice to this methodology in dealing with the in dealing with the materials practically and theoretically to what extent so in other words the 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 the, the where he where he arrived in 1934 is not where he was in 1925 and so it's that journey i think that we've got to understand and and the trajectory that vygotsky was on in order in order i think to answer that question probably more constructive than I can. In other words, we need to look at, at his attempts to develop and elaborate that kind of approach and the sequence of those attempts in order to see the kind of, uh, the kind of development that Vygotsky was making. Secondly, on the question of uh, Stalinist persecution, um, there's some detailed discussion of, of this um, by uh, Jasnitsky and, and others. Um, Vygotsky and colleagues certainly were being subjected to public criticism of their works and were having to defend themselves or prepare to defend themselves against these public criticisms that were being made by some of the uh, Stalinist ideologues of the time who were criticizing their work. Um, and you can read these criticisms. There is a collection of these uh, that uh, Van der Veer and Valsina put together, I think. Um, but at the time of Vygotsky's uh, death, there was certainly no direct, um, direct and immediate coercive control of his work. Uh, there was no uh, direct imposition of any sanctions against him at that time, although he did fear that uh, they, they, there might be, there might very well be um, in the near future. I think that, that's how I would answer that one. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you. And so, Peter, so what do you prefer to do now to see the other questions or go ahead uh, with your uh, discussions? Should we, should we take uh, another couple of questions, uh, Cesar, do you think? Okay. And then, then maybe I can do 10 minutes on, on Vygotsky's crisis. Okay, so uh, Joselia, uh, Luis, uh, jo Luiz Gonçalves. Ou Josélia, não sei. Ah, Luiz Gonçalves. Obrigado. Posso perguntar? Luiz Gonçalves. Hi. Ok. É, é, professor Peter, boa tarde. Obrigado. É, ainda sobre o Marx, é, sua citação da análise histórica do Marx sobre o feudalismo e sobre como as relações pessoais e produtivas eram mais diretas enquanto no capitalismo elas aparecem invertidas, eu gostaria que o senhor, por favor, comentasse se é, a gente pode aplicar, nesse caso, é, as categorias de é, mediação de primeira ordem e mediação de segunda ordem do Lukács. E também é, se a gente pode trazer para esse processo de inversão é, as ideias do... Uh, Estou fugindo o nome dele agora. É, a pesquisa sobre é, como as... Uh, a, 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 meu Deus, estou me fugindo o nome agora. É o Son Hattel. A, a, a pesquisa é que mais. o Son Hattel faz sobre é, como a forma mercadoria muda a estrutura de consciência é do ser social, isso começa, o Son Hattel fala disso lá em Parmênides, lá no início dos gregos, como as relações de troca, elas começam entre produtores individuais, em oposição entre si, começam a mudar as estruturas de consciência, 
se a gente pode trazer o som réptil para essa discussão. Obrigado. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. That, that, that is a very good and very interesting point, and I, and I thank you for that. Um, I would have to think about the question uh, of Lukács a bit more uh, in order to answer that specific question. Uh, but but you're, you're absolutely right, uh, and, and this, is, this is what Marx is actually concentrating on. He, he is concentrating on, in effect, the, the effects on not just on human beings' lives, but on their ways of, of, of thinking and feeling of the way that productive activity is organized uh, in capitalist production in terms of uh, ex ex production and exchange. And so that these things have a very powerful influence on, on, on how we experience the world, how we experience ourselves. Um, the alienation that Marx discusses um, is, is exactly that. It's, 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 it's something that's rooted in the way that our own powers and capacities become unrecognizable to us. And, the, and of course, the experiences and the feelings and the, and the ideas and the perspectives which that kind of alienated existence uh, produces in us. So I, 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 I think I'm in agreement with you there. I, I wasn't aware that, the, that it had been a subject for uh, ancient debate and, and that is interesting. And I'm, sh I'm sure Marx was. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that that was part of his own um, education and thinking around precisely these problems. So. I thank you very much for that. Very interesting indeed. Okay, Josélia. Good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> nice to meet you, Peter. And you, thank you. I'd like to tell you something about our new curriculum in Brazil. Uh -huh. And uh, something that I observe in the new curriculum is that I think it's a top-down theory because it's come from uh, up to down. There was no consultation, no information with the teachers from Brazil. It was uh, imposed the curriculum and they didn't uh, expect, they didn't expect that the teachers from Brazil, they live in different regions and they have different capacities and they have different realities, what make us feel a little bit insecure because they gave us a deadline to apply the curriculum. And if you are going to put a little bit about what Vygotsky says, he says that the most interesting thing, the most important thing would be the interaction between people, yes, in the mental development through learning new things. And then what all the regions, all the states of Brazil had to do, they had to get the national curriculum and split up in each different state and region to make adaptations. And they forgot the most important thing, it was the teacher, the educators, they didn't prepare the educators before the, the curriculum. They didn't ask opinions for the educators, that they are in real contact with the students. That's sometimes why you question ourselves. You impose a curriculum, you impose the books, and you don't know the reality of the students and not even the teachers, and not even the valorize the teachers, and not even the salary of the teachers in so many uh, negative aspects, but the, the curriculum is beautiful, it's all colorful, but in relation to the applicability of the curriculum, that's what you are questioning ourselves. How is the Brazilian teacher will apply a curriculum if they were not questioned about the curriculum and not the reality was really, really deep a deep study about the reality of the teacher in different areas of Brazil, like urban areas and rural areas, private sector and public sector, 
And that's the difference. In the, in the private sector, it should work well because they have all that structure. And then what about the public sector? How would it would be applied? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you Peter, very much. I don't know if you wanted to answer this question because it's a little bit out of what we are discussing here. I don't know. Well, I, I would just say, thank you, Cecil. Yes, I, I, would, I would just say that, again, it, it demonstrates the extent to which um, the, the self-organization and autonomy and independence of communities who take responsibility for their, for their own well-being, this is a threat. This is a threat to the people who run Brazil. It's a threat to people everywhere. But you can see clearly that the, that the motivation for such uh, authoritarian uh, and intrusive control uh, and development of a curriculum of that kind is, is a direct political attack on the communities of, uh, and, and working people of, uh, of, of Brazil. Um, uh, be, because, precisely because of the reasons um, we've just we've just heard, because it, it 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 prevents any initiative, any independence, any freedom of thinking, any autonomous organisation and interactions, because these are dangerous to the uh, to the authorities. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Okay, so let's go or. There is another question from Tanya. Tanya, uh -huh. could you answer? Could you ask your question, please? Thank you, Professor. Um, I, I, Thank you. I tend to be quite um, obnubilated in my speech, even though I'm an English speaker as a second language. I'm a Brazilian, and I am at the State University of New York in uh -huh. small town in New York. Um, but I wrote down what I wanted to say here, but how would a Marxist way of thinking would reconcile the myth of separability that capitalism promotes and the advances in consciousness by individuals and groups aware of the logic of domination that um, the former speaker just raised so well, you know, the logic of domination and therefore understand the relational and non-separation aspects of life in society now, which is also a result of capitalism yeah. mode of production. Does, does that say, because that's what I try to teach. I'm a teacher educator. So that understanding, but I also am aware that I understand that because of where we are. So. Yes. Yes, a, a very good point, and I, and, I, and I think this is the essential issue: uh, the the separation and the fragmentation of communities and, and working people on, under capitalism is one of the most serious obstacles to to a develop to the development of that class consciousness uh, and that community consciousness, which is necessary to 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 fight back and resist. Uh, but of course, that 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 separateness we feel can't be overcome uh, just in, a, in in our heads. It, we we have to find ways that separation in practice can 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 be mitigated or ended by forms of cooperation, forms of collaboration, forms of communal activity of one kind or another. It's these forms of activity that bring us into actual joint. Um, activity where we're not separate we, I mean historically of course the trade unions were the main vehicle for that kind of uh, original consciousness class consciousness and and they were of course formed in the most di difficult dangerous and violent conditions as, as we know still is the case today how trade unionists are, are victimized persecuted and often killed for 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 doing what they're doing um there's a, there's a big movement now both in the us and in europe in in the uk to unionize uh the big tech companies um and also the fast food uh, companies 
you know, McDonald's and so on. And, and th there, there's enormous success in here with these, but it's also a very difficult struggle. Uh, and, and unfortunately, that's where we are. Um, we've, got to we've got to learn to, to, to be able to join together and develop these communal forms of struggle. But it's not an it's not an easy task, uh, and it's certainly not a task, uh, a theoretical task. It's it's one that we have to find ways of doing. Um, you know, uh, whether we like it or not, <laughs> um, I'm afraid. Anyway, I think I thank you for your question. I've got no I've got no answers, obviously, but <laughs> but I thank you for the question. Thank you. Mood. It's up to you, Peter. Now you can go ahead. Should, should I do a, la a last little bit on on Vygotsky then? Do you think just just to give us a at least a bit of a a sense of of things? Do you think if I go to my um, my my um, screen here? Um, Can't even find it now. Just let me go out of my full screen a second. I think it's. I think my PowerPoint is lurking somewhere, but uh, yeah, I think it's there. Hopefully. Yeah. For. Some reason I'm not quite sure of. It's not coming up. Hang on a sec. Let's try that one. I've lost it, Cesar. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry. Power, you can find my, yourself. Uh, hang on a sec. Let me just let me just give it one more go. See if I can see if I can open it. Um, it's there. You see, it's there when I open that, and then when I go back to to us, maybe it's hiding someone. Uh, ah, yes, got it. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Right. Okay. This is going to be a very, a very brief. <laughs> version of uh, of this section of the talk which was looking specifically at uh, the historical meaning of the psychological crisis in, in Vygotsky. It's quite a remarkable text um, and uh, if, if Vygotsky had only written this one text he would, I think he would still be famous in psychology <laughs> because it's such so interesting and so insightful. Um, and uh, this is written in 1925, published in 1925, and covers so much ground. There are important issues there for us, I think. Uh, and it's a direct attempt by Vygotsky to, to look at the problems that we've been considering already. How do we remake psychology on the basis of Marx's method? How do we understand that method? How do we use it? How do we use that Marx's work to 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 actually reimagine a psychology? And with those insights, Vygotsky criticizes all those existing currents, contemporary currents of psychology in Russia and uh, in, and elsewhere in the world, in Europe and North America, and also looks at the the contributions, the attempts by uh, psychologists in Russia, uh, in, in, in post-revolutionary Russia, to develop a, a Marxist psychology. So it's very, very interesting for all of that. So he's talking about, number one, Marx's method and the method of psychology. Psychology as a natural science, in his view. A critique of the theories, approaches, and the language of existing psychological approaches. Marxist psychology and its failings, the criterion of practice as the forefront of psychological research, 
Um, in the gen in the crisis of psychology, as he sees it, he sees in that behind that the struggle between idealism and materialism, and defines materialism in in Lenin's sense. He looks at Marx's capital and the germ cell methodology that Marx uses and its relevance for psychology. Looks at the prospects and pathways for for a Marxist psychology of the future and gives an overall vision of humanity of the future and the psychology of the new human being that uh, will be possible uh, with the transition to the new society. Um, so <laughs> there's a lot in there, let's say. Um, let me just... Um, Let me just have a look at, for example, this, this is about the prospects of a Marxist psychology. The psychology about which we are talking does not yet exist, he says. It still has to be created. And by more than one school, many generations, he says, of psychologists will work on it, as James said. Psychology will have its geniuses and its ordinary investigators, but what will emerge from the joint work of the generations of both the geniuses and the simple skilled workmen of science will be psychology. With this name, our science will enter the new society on the threshold of which it begins to take shape. Our science could not, oops, and cannot develop in the old society. We cannot master the truth about personality and personality itself so long as mankind has not mastered the truth about society and society itself. In contrast, the new, in the new society, our science will take a central place in life. In other words, what Vygotsky is saying is there can't be this new psychology. There certainly doesn't exist now. And it can't exist until the people exist <laughs> who are capable of thinking and being in a new way to create this psychology. And that's very interesting because much of the discussion surrounding Marxist psychology often says that, yeah, Vygotsky had a Marxist psychology, he had that, he had it already, but that's not what Vygotsky is saying. He's saying, first of all, Marxist psychology doesn't exist now and it won't exist for many generations because the new society doesn't exist yet. But we've all got, our task is to work towards it, to try, to do what we can, to work towards that. All the different schools are part of that, but we've got to be able to also think about Marx's own method and how we can use that method, or rather elaborate a method of our own for psychology. It's not a question of taking formulas from Marx or from Hegel or anywhere else and imposing them on anything. It's a question of doing the diligent, hard, creative work to work out, as Marx did in his own work, to work out these new concepts in psychology, these new approaches based on applied psychology, based on the problems, the psychological problems that we have to tackle right now in education and rehabilitation. This is, where, this is how we're going to change psychology, by focusing on the tasks that, of the present and, and rethinking them and working towards this psychology of the future. Um, but we've been talking about Marx's germ cell method. Uh, and Vygotsky's um, argument in this particular work was that this we, we've got to try and work out what Marx was doing and, and how we can do that for a psychology. He's, he, he says that Marx says essentially the same when he compares, we've, we've had that quotation already, abstraction with a microscope and chemical reactions in the natural sciences. The whole of Das Kapital, he says, is written according to this method. Marx analyzes the cell of bourgeois society, the form of the commodity value, and shows that a mature body can be more easily studied than a cell. 
He discerns the structure of the whole social order and all economic formations in this cell, which is actually not quite true, but anyway. He says that to the uninitiated, its analysis may seem the hair splitting of details. We are indeed dealing with details, but such details as microscopic anatomy is also dealing with. He who, now this is what Vygotsky says, he who, he who can decipher the meaning of the cell of psychology, the mechanism of one reaction has found the key to psychology. That's, that is at that point, at that stage, how Vygotsky's thinking had developed that, up to that point on the relevance of Marx's method. And in particular, what would be the germ cell for this general human psychology, the meaning of one reaction, which of course is couched in the discourse, as well as the ideas of particular traditions of reflexology and reactology of that time. So Mark Vygotsky is very interesting on, on the method, very insightful about his critiques of psychological perspectives. And that's how he saw things at that point. And this, this, this article, the crisis article, needs therefore to be taken together with those other articles and other research work that, that Vygotsky was doing and writing at the time about consciousness and about research in reflexology to understand what he meant by that meaning of one reaction as the germ cell. So I think when we're looking at Vygotsky's uh, appropriation, if you like, of Marx's methodology, we, we need to start where Vygotsky started and have a look at how he, how he developed, progressively developed his idea of how Marx's germ cell methodology would be relevant to psychology. So I thought that at next stage for the next uh, seminar, we could look first of all at what positive contributions to a general psychology did Vygotsky make in accordance with his own understanding of Marx's methodology around the time of the crisis text and, and pro probably subsequently, and how was the germ cell methodology developed and what were its initial outcomes in that uh, in in that early work, before we go on to look at some of the later work, so uh, that that would be that would be the quick version <laughs> of that uh, section of the talk, and I'll stop sharing there. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It is really nice. We have we still have. Uh, uh, nine minutes. If right. someone wanted to ask a question or say something. Maybe Fernanda Gallery. Maybe Fernanda, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I would like to ask a question. Um, Peter, I'm very, as you know, thank, first of all, thank you very much for the discussion, for the text you sent us. Um, My pleasure. I, couldn't, I couldn't read all of them yet, but no. <laughs> I was impressed by, by some of them, which, which I didn't know, and I liked yours especially. I think that everyone should read yours, mainly because it uh, puts uh, a claim on the reason for linguists such as us to read Marx and understand the importance that Marx has for us. So I think that is an essential text for us and for everyone, uh, of course. So thank you very much. Uh, I especially yeah. like this discussion, um, this discussion you, you, you ended with about the germ cell. In, yeah. the, um, in our group, we have been, this, in my classes actually, we have been discussing about the germ cell and uh, this connection, how, how we understand the germ cell. And I think that it goes back to um, one of the, the, the quotes that you made about the importance of Marx to Vygotsky relating to the, this idea that if Marx didn't do much, if only because of what he said about um, our emphasis on man in action as the, 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 the essence, it would be already a lot 
and Vygotsky captures this very well in the text that you mentioned. But um, I would like to listen to you saying how this, this influences how we conduct research, how we choose our own, um, how we select what to write about when we are in the field work also, and how, how important this is for us um, to realize the, the that our choices on how to conduct research, they are not so open. They are, they are constrained by the choice of literature and our choice as Marxist, as we got schemes. So could you say a little bit about this? And thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, I'm sure you, you could say more than me about, about this. Um, yes, indeed. Um, and I mean, it's interesting to think about that same question for in application both to Vygotsky and Marx. Um, actually, we could ask of all these uh, these great contributors, um, how how was it and and how is it that given the constraints of the time, they they selected they prioritized the things that they that they did, um, and obviously I. I I would say probably the first thing is that we, we, you know, we have to start where we are, don't we? We, we can't start in another place. Um, and we, we know that there are problems everywhere. Um, we, we know the problems of, 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 of your own profession and of other professions in Brazil. We've talked a, bit, a little bit about these new developments today. Um, and uh, we may well be co very constrained in how we may be able to address those problems for political reasons and other reasons, as we know. Um, there's no easy answer, is there? Um, no easy answer. I mean, it, it's all it's all about what what contribution we think we can make in in any way to 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 thinking about those problems or or to getting involved with others. Uh, to think about those problems, e even if it's a discussion circle, even if even if we're sitting around thinking about Marx's work, uh, it's a contribution. Um, it, it might be the only contribution we can make at that point. So it's a difficult one, I think, isn't it, of, of how we how we prioritize. Um, I mean, personally, I've 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 had that problem, you know, a long time, let's say, <laughs> and. Um, over the last years, in particular during the pandemic, I, I decided to reprioritize my own activities uh, in order to try and uh, 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 and get more involved, let's say, in political action. Um, and I have to say, it was a total failure. So. <laughs> <laughs> there is so, no failure uh, if we are still struggling. No, there is no right. struggling. There is Absolutely no failure. Right. <laughs> absolutely right absolutely right well I, but i think that that's a, that that sort of question is 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 one i think of a of, of very profound interest for all of us and and it may be that perhaps through the seminars and and, and in other ways maybe we can think about those things and and, and and think about them a little bit more but i thank you as all, always for 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 what you're doing and your question yeah, I was thinking about Freire and when he talks about indignation, perhaps yeah. what yeah. makes us feel this indignation, this is yeah. what may lead our choice on what we have to research. Our yes, that's research. right. Yeah, that's that, absolutely. I mean, that's sometimes we, we're so indignant, we don't care about the consequences, you know. <laughs> yeah. For me, I'm, I'm in this line for a long time. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> I just... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Peter. It is a, there is another person. Oh, there is. Yes, I Karina. Ah, I é, eu, eu não vejo. É Karina. Oi. Não. Bom dia. Quem está querendo fazer Bom a dia. pergunta? Acho que é Karina. Good morning. Posso fazer a pergunta? Pode, pode. É que eu não consigo Sim. ver direito. Oi, bom fazer. dia, novamente. É, eu sou Karina, sou Hi. professora da Educação Básica, like é, trabalho com a Educação do Campo, no curso técnico em Agroecologia, uh -huh. aqui no estado de Mato Grosso. Primeiramente, gostaria de agradecer pela oportunidade 
é, dessa manhã de formação com o professor Peter Jones e todos os organizadores do evento. Muito obrigada. Boa é, eu eu gostaria de fazer uma pergunta, porque enquanto educadora, é, por mais que nós tentamos trabalhar com a pedagogia de uma educação libertadora, né, como o Paulo Freire aí nos deixou um grande legado, né, e que é, é o que nos sustenta muitas vezes diante de um governo atual opressor, que nós somos geridos, né? É, eu gostaria de perguntar para o professor Peter Jones, como é possível que nós, sendo professores da educação básica, atualmente nós somos, é, temos como representante da Secretaria da Educação é, um profissional que é engenheiro civil, que nem é formado sequer em licenciatura. Então, ele não tem formação básica em educação. Esse é o principal absurdo que nós temos atualmente no estado de Mato Grosso. E ele está conduzindo e implementando normas dentro da educação, é, está terceirizando o serviço da educação, né, por meio do novo ensino médio, de forma que cada vez mais a educação tem se tornado um produto do capitalismo. Inclusive, nós somos obrigados a seguir o material, isso que chamam de estruturado, mas é totalmente desestruturado, porque vem com erros conceituais é, grotescos, né? Então, eu pergunto, diante de uma gestão tão autoritária, tão opressora, onde a gente vê que a educação, o sistema de ensino brasileiro, ele tem se, torna, ele tem se colocado acima da própria Constituição Federal, né, de 1988, é, e que obriga o professor a trabalhar com material antididático, que eu chamo de antididático e antipedagógico, né? Como é possível a gente trabalhar com uma educação libertadora, sendo que nós somos obrigados o tempo inteiro a seguir um material pronto, engessado, e nosso direito de liberdade de expressão e, 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 e formação é cerceado o tempo inteiro por gestões autoritárias? Yes, thank you very much a minha for pergunta that. é no it's sentido a, de como não perder a esperança e, ao mesmo tempo, o senso de realidade dentro dos limites que nós temos na educação brasileira atualmente. Muito obrigada. Sim, yes, and thank you for that. It's a, it's a, a terrible situation, I understand, and, and difficult to keep hope uh, alive in that. Um, I, I, I expect, however, that this is but only one symptom of a, of a general uh, attack by uh, Brazilian elites on all sectors of uh, working communities uh, and classes and, and so on. And that education is, a, as it always has been, a, a primary target for intervention by uh, authoritarian states and dictatorial regimes because precisely because of its ideological importance and its social importance to to all of us to, to children's development and so on so um i i hesitate to give any specific recommendation on this because i, I i'm not aware of the concrete situation on the ground um but This is first, first of all, as a general political problem, and, and, and therefore, is there hope to be gained in, uh, in a change, in a future change of the regime in Brazil? Are we, are we able to imagine that there might be some general social outcry, rebellion uh, expressed in a change of government in, in, in Brazil? Will that lead, do you, you think, to any positives? Uh, thank you, Peter, and thank you for everybody who made the questions. That is it's something that is very important for the person who is talking and the ones that are listening. Thank you for all. And uh, all the all the, the the news and this uh, talk, Peter's uh, first session of the seminar is going to be on the Padlet. Okay. Então essa sessão essa sessão e a, o que o Peter disse, as perguntas, todas elas vão estar no Padlet. Então, as pessoas podem retomar lá no Padlet, ok? Uh, 
So thank you. It was very, very interesting. And uh, Fernanda, you wanted to say something more? No, I was, I, I was just applauding. I was just applauding him. <laughs> I hope uh, Adolfo too, and I hope that the next session we have Ia and Sueli with us. I hope very much. Yes, I, okay. I hope so. And if you could give them uh, my love and best wishes, uh, okay. I'll be very grateful. Uh, I can. I should also say that I have the texts and the PowerPoint slides, which which will be available or can be made available if if anybody want would prefer to read those or see those. That, that's fine if, if anybody's interested in so. stuff. Okay, they will be on the Padlet. Os textos vão estar no Padlet, okay? So everybody can read it. Todo mundo pode ler. Então, Peter, thank you. My, uh, uh, have a nice day. And thank you. To the next session. To, no, we will talk prior to that, okay? Yes, I, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, Bye. thank you thank for you everybody. To all. Thank bye. you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Peter. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you bye to bye. everybody. See bye. you later. All the best. Bye. See, bye bye. See you on the next session. We didn't take a photograph anyway. Ah. Oh, what a pity. Well, we're taking.